before you change anything on the farm, you need to change the way you look at a vineyard. The majority of the population, they close their eyes, they think of a vineyard, all they see are, are grapevines. Mm -hmm. uh, accept the fact that there are gonna be weeds, but stop looking at them as weeds. Look at them as a beneficial habitat. You know, mm -hmm. they all serve a purpose. Every flower on every plant is gonna attract some other insect species. So I think getting, getting rid of that mentality is the first step. I mean, we've had some of the driest, you know, conditions in a very, very long time. If we didn't get the rain, the, the atmospheric river, they called it, mm -hmm. um, in January, then it would have been the driest year on record since, I think, 1870 is, mm -hmm. is what I was reading. But even with that rain, the last two years combined, mm -hmm. um, precipitation is still the lowest it's been in probably like 100 years. Our annual rainfall's 26 inches in this corridor and we're at like 13. Yeah. And we, we've been fortunate because, so we're clay over limestone. Mm -hmm. So in the early years when we were wanting, you know, intentionally wanting to dry farm, when there was, when the root system was down low, was not real deep, you know, there's still water in that clay. Mm -hmm. And then once the vines tap into the limestone, the limestone acts as a big sponge and just sucks up all the water from the winter rains and then doses it back during the, the growing season. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, really a cool, unique component for this, this part of the world. Another thing, we have been practicing biodynamic organics for a while and, and a lot mm -hmm. of that is increasing soil organic matter, soil organic carbon. And the Rodale Institute just put out a number uh, a couple weeks ago where there, I think it was for every 1% increase in organic matter in the soil, it increases your holding capacity by like 50,000 gallons per acre. So with those practices in mind, I, I think that we're a little better off than, you know, someone who's been spraying pre-emergent or mm -hmm. herbicide for years and they don't have any organic matter. Mm -hmm. Are there any concerns for you guys? A because of the dry, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it'd be, uh, it would be sort of, immature to not yeah. not be concerned about right. it um, but with that being said I don't think we'll have any issues because we have been pushing towards dry farming and when, when we do irrigate it's very little mm -hmm. long soaks to, to to promote the deeper roots mm -hmm. we'll we'll learn more as the years go on And then, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep moving them around the perimeter. Because, because the buds have pushed, we're not going to put them in the vineyard at all this year. Yeah. Um, and we would have normally done it earlier, but it was such a dry winter and the cover crop didn't get a chance to push until pretty late. And we wanted to give it a chance to, to go to seed and, and do all the beneficial stuff. We spend so much money year in, year out on cover crop seeds mm -hmm. and the time involved to actually seed it. Um, that it doesn't make sense for us just to let it all go to waste if, if the sheep mow it down before it gets a chance to actually do anything beneficial. I think whenever you're dealing with sheep and, and these, some of these methods, it's all about, you need, you need to be malleable, you need to be adaptive. You can't be dogmatic. You can't be, yeah, it's, it's all about, you know, we can, we can, we try to be proactive in everything we do, but you know, sometimes like, well, that's not going to work, or timing's not going to work, or, yeah. you know, Mother Nature is a fickle partner. Yeah. Yeah. Last time we were here, you guys were going through uh -huh. the ROC checklist, you know. We come back a couple, uh, a couple months later, and, you know, this is part, one of the many things you yeah. guys have to do to get certified. So talk me through, what, what are we actually doing here? So the ROC... They have you do um, two different types of soil tests, uh, a 
test that you send to the lab, and then you do that every three years, mm -hmm. and an infield soil tests. So you do that every year. Mm -hmm. So we're doing one of the one of the infield soil tests. This particular one is called a soil aggregate test, and it's essentially measuring um, the the different glues that are in the soil, holding it together. For us, we have the ground cover in between the vine rows. Mm -hmm. Um, all the roots there are letting off different chemical glues and stuff and the roots themselves help to increase so soil structure and all of that helps to negate erosion. It's, it's pretty much there to, to hold the topsoil there, mm -hmm. which is one of the big problems with conventional farming is the loss of topsoil. The soil aggregate test is essentially a way to measure your soil structure. There's another test an, an infill test, which is just smelling the soil. Mm -hmm. And if it smells earthy and pleasant like that, that's great. If it smells kind of minerally, then, then that's indicative of maybe you need some more organic matter in the soil. If it smells sour, then uh, your soils are potentially waterlogged and there's more of the anaerobic microbes that, that you don't want as much. Mm -hmm. um, so. It can tell you a number of things just, just based off of the smell and color. So it's got that good earthy smell. Yeah. Yeah. It smells like after yeah. a rain, after a rain yeah. event. Yeah. Humus. Mm -hmm. It breaks apart nicely. That's always a good sign. Yeah. Like you can smell it and it smells good. So our five minutes is up on that jar. Clear water. Clear water and the pet is almost completely <clears throat> intact. So that would be a rock rating of good, which is as I think that's we're good that's or better than good. Yeah, that's fucking perfect. <laughs> that's it. It's gooder. Yeah. Gooder. <laughs> yeah. So there's that test done. The intention of ROC is, is for the farmer to, to actually be out checking, checking in your land regularly and it's, it's a good push for me to actually go out and do that and, and check in on the soil, check in on the plant health. Oh, that's a turd. <laughs> in my mind I'm thinking to myself like, are they fucking with, are they fucking with me right now? Like, taste some dirt, Jeff. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Kind of gritty. Oh, because it is. Grit, yeah. Mm. Gritty. It's like it's like mud pie when you as a kid. You're kind of looking for any off flavors. So like I, like like sourness is mm. is not good. Um, you're just kind of, kind of like pleasant. Still dirt, mm -hmm. but you know like the, the the smell and taste of the air after rain, like that nice smell of earth is kind of what you're looking for. Look at look at that. Yeah. Look Oops, at sorry. All the roots. You're good. Look at that, yeah. yeah. Wow. And then every now and again you'll see a little critter or a worm going around too, which is good. That's the first few inches and look at all that, just uh -huh. keeping that topsoil together. Never thought I'd be so fascinated. <laughs> by a root ball? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's it's interesting that the first time someone's like, well, we're not farming a crop we're farming soil right yeah and that was like a oh that was one of those wow. head scratching light bulb kind of <laughs> uh, right because if you're farming soil then everything from that soil should be really good mm -hmm. but if you're just farming for that crop and you have no soil no foundation no nutrient then you're like wow mm -hmm. why isn't this what it, what we're expecting it to be yeah
we're springtime, you know, so why is this an exciting time for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's life. The vineyard is waking up. Um, you know, it's something we prepare all winter for with the pruning and uh, the seeding of the cover crop. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, this is where it all begins. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is the start of another vintage and hopefully it's an amazing one. Um, you know, dealing with mother nature's curveballs is always exciting. Yeah. You never know what she's gonna throw at you and it just keeps you on your toes. So with organic and biodynamic or generative farming, our toolbox is really small mm -hmm. as far as what we can use to deal with pest issues. Mm -hmm. You're just constantly thinking outside of the box. You can't just buy a product. You know, leaf hoppers on a conventional scale are really easy to deal with. Mm -hmm. All you do is you go and you buy an insecticide, you put it through your drip system, the plant uptakes, that insecticide, the leaf hopper, leaf hopper bites the plant, it dies. It dies. Yeah. We don't have that option, right? So right. we need to think, well, what in nature eats leaf hoppers, yeah. right? So yeah. we plant species to promote those beneficial insects, to bring them into the vineyard. You know, I think with organics and biodynamics and regenerative farming, you're 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 trying to recreate a natural process. The, the beneficial plants don't really need a lot of rain. Um, it just needs to be timed correctly. All those beneficial plantings, the annuals that we put out, they're all going to be blooming in about two or three weeks. So that, that, those late rains were huge for us because the, the, the non-beneficials, they're successful species. They're way more successful than the beneficial insects, right? They're feeding on plant matter. There's tons of plant matter everywhere you look. Without, without a late rain and blooms of flowers to bring in your beneficials, that leafhopper population gets out of control. Hopefully, I mean, I'm looking down, I'm seeing ladybugs cruise around in here right now. They're, they're a big one. Um, but with those late rains and all this bloom, you know, I think we should be in pretty good shape, hopefully. I mean, it's a battlefield right beneath our feet right now. <laughs> it's, oh, it is. Combating nature with nature. Right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the idea, idea. is, 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 Biodiversity, 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 right? Some guys look down, they say, you got weeds in your field. I don't have weeds in my field. I have, I have a habitat for beneficial insects. How do you suggest it to the high, the, the, Nutrient-rich food it takes them about a month, and then they just start really thinking out. Talk about nutrients. Yeah, yeah, you got some nutrients. I got shoes. I got some nutrients in my shoes. Uh, I was slipping and sliding around. I mean, this is uh, the two driest winters in 170 years, according to our local weatherman. Mm -hmm. um, this grass, you know, this vineyard should have three feet, four feet, five feet of grass growing. It can mm. grow. A lot more feed normally. Yep. Um, so that means we're we're looking at issues um, midsummer, basically running out of feed. So we're dropping mm. the size of the herd. Hmm. Um, so you're constantly trying to, based on the year, you got to have the number right for the mass sheep you have. Otherwise, it gets really expensive because you're having to buy feed. Why why are sheep so important for a vineyard? The okay, the, yeah, the sheep are important not just for vineyards. Mm -hmm. The vineyard's just here. It's the here. vineyard happens to be sitting on top of the grass land. Our vineyard manager, he sees a vineyard. All I see is pasture. And pasture, grasslands, have always, since the beginning of time, had a symbiotic relationship with herbivores. It's not wet enough. Okay, here we go. This plant was meant to be eaten by an herbivore. And it thrives when it gets eaten by an herbivore. I've read a study they did in China where they 
um, measured the effect of cutting grass as opposed to it being grazed. Yeah. And there's enzymes in the saliva that get the plant to have a self-defense mechanism and makes it grow back faster than if you just cut it. Mm. So the saliva of these herbivores is actually helping the plant recover faster than it would if you just cut it with a lawnmower. It's not just the cutting. There's, yeah. there's, a, there's a relationship there that we can't replace, right? Um, so the plant gets bit. The, it it uh, lets the plant know through the, the enzymes in the saliva that it's been attacked and it needs to respond to that. The root system is full of carbohydrates and wow, you can really see the yeah. nodes on there. Those are nitrogen fixing. And what happens is this plant has carbohydrates stored in its root and it'll release those into the soil around the root system, which feeds the microorganisms. The microorganisms will mine the soil. They will literally break down unavailable nutrients in the soil and make them available to this plant. So a lot of minerals in the ground just aren't available to plants. That's why we use liquid nitrogen. We use um, mm -hmm. liquid fertilizers are injected into the irrigation system and they do the same thing. They make those nutrients super available to the plants but they're not renewable, you gotta go buy them again. Mm -hmm. In this method, the plants feeding the microorganisms, they're breaking down and making that available to the plant. The plant then uses that to restore and heal itself. And um, that relationship, that the herbivores attacking it, the plant responding by feeding the microorganisms and building soil and growing again is why the, it's so important that we have herbivores on the land, on all the land. Mm -hmm. Like it, if it's grassland, it needs to have animals eating it. If you're in agriculture, if you're working with livestock, if you're working with vineyards, it, uh, we're, we stay up at night worrying about rain, we're worrying about the heat events, we're worrying about the weather, and um, it, it, it's life and death for the herd, it's, it's you know, it, uh, make or break for the vineyard, so it's really important for us. And that's why a lot of the regenerative agricultural things that we're excited about are all about being sustainable, being able to survive mm -hmm. rough years like this and get through them without it breaking the bank. So yeah. um, we're all for that. Yeah, I heard that. There's an entire world beneath your big toe yeah. that is yet to be explained, right? There's this interaction that's taking place that we can't even begin to comprehend. And um, with that, that ecosystem that is beneath our feet, there's a symbiotic relationship that occurs between the root systems of plants and all those microorganisms. And you know, with a healthy, vibrant ecosystem in that soil profile, it's promoting a healthy root system for the grapevine. Right, that's, that's where it all starts, it's where ROC started, it's all about the soil. And whatever we can do to, to make it healthier, we have to do. Um, you know, you have a healthy soil, you have a healthy plant. So that's, that's the interaction there with regenerative farming, is regenerating your soil, you know, creating that ecosystem down there, creating that healthy microbiome and, and really promoting um, um, a healthy life cycle for, for whatever is occurring under our feet. I feel like there's a pretty direct translation between what you do in the vineyard and what you taste in the glass. We had the uh, CCOF and Demeter inspector, Caroline. You're doing undervine cultivation here. Any other pest or disease issues that you're dealing with? The grape comes from the Fertile Crescent. It's a kind of a desert, so it's a hardy plant. It will survive. 
Right now, it's shaping up to be an amazing vintage. I think we're gonna see higher concentrations, more depth of flavor. The soil is more of a focus than it's ever been. It's not just the stuff that holds the vine's roots in place. It's, it's something which is alive in its own way.